We are talking about back to the basics. Back to the basics is a terminology uh, that pro sports teams use whenever they have their spring uh, training. And they go back and learn how to do those things they uh, excel at through the season. They excel at it because they practice them again in the spring. But let's look at what we talked about, just a couple of uh, paragraphs, what we talked about last week. And then we're going to be in verse 31 through the end of the chapter. So the last time we met, we talked about uh, how we're adopted by God. And uh, how that is a relationship thing, not a um, not work to become children of God, but that we are adopted into Christ's uh, family. We talked a little bit about that and how that uh, we don't have to work to be that, but we are that by relationship with the Lord. That doesn't mean that we. Uh, we're contrary uh, to being a Christian. It doesn't mean that we do whatever we want, uh, but it does mean that how many knows that we're human and we'll, we'll make mistakes and do things that uh, we wish we hadn't. Uh, but that does not take away us being a child of God. So that was a big part of the discussion that we talked about last week. And on top of that, we said that it was the Holy Spirit that helps us in our walk with the Lord. And I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit, aren't you? Amen. Uh, it really helps us to do that. Yeah. And not only does the Holy Spirit help us in our walk, but it's actually the Holy Spirit that witnesses to us that we are children of God. Uh, how many times you ever get up and just didn't feel very saved, you know? Uh, maybe you had a bad day, had a bad morning, bad night. Uh, you just don't feel good. Whatever it might be, maybe... Uh, you had, you know, somebody, uh, an argument with someone, whatever. You may not feel saved, but you are, and the Holy Spirit testifies to us of our salvation. And it gives a witness. So we can know. If you encounter people who said, I think so, I hope so, maybe I'm saved, uh, let them know that you can know. And uh, so we can know that we're saved. And if we are children of God then we have an inheritance. Uh, on this earth, you may have never received an inheritance from loved ones who passed away, mom, dad, whatever. You may not, never have received an inheritance, but uh, we have an inheritance as children of God. The Bible says we're heirs and co-heirs. Uh, we're heirs of, of God and co-heirs with Christ. And so that means everything that Christ paid for and did to pay for, we now have. Whether it be our salvation, our healing, whatever that might be, uh, we have that as an inheritance. And that inheritance is not on, uh, not about doing, but about being. We're, we're children uh, of God. So, but as children of God, and, and I'm about to wrap up what we talked about last week. As children of God, we. Not only do we have an inheritance, but there's also a responsibility, and sometimes we suffer with Christ. The Bible says that the disciples were, if you read their stories, they were honored to be able to suffer for the cause of Christ. Uh, many of them were martyred, uh, and uh, Peter in particular, it, it is said of him that he was... Uh, crucified upside down because he did not feel worthy to be crucified like his Savior, right? Uh, so uh, we do have suffering. You can have suffering. Uh, but the, the greatest verse that I, watch, I look, really love in this chapter is that that suffering doesn't compare at all to the glory that we shall receive. And uh, so that's exciting uh, to know that. And then the very last thing, we had a big discussion about this. The very last thing we talked about was that how the Holy Spirit can help us pray whenever we don't know how to pray. Uh, we talked about how the Spirit will intercede through us, that uh, whether speaking in tongues or through uh, 
utterances or groanings that we do not understand. Uh, the Spirit prays through us, and He prays not just anything, but He prays the will of God. So if you're in a situation and you don't know which direction to turn or where to go, uh, the answer is to pray in the Spirit. And uh, you'll get a break. You'll get breakthrough. I mean, I've experienced that before. When I didn't know what to do, but the Holy Spirit did. And He prays the will of the, of the Father over us. So, uh, <clears throat> so now we're in verse 31, and it's kind of the conclusion of this chapter, this great tra chapter. Uh, and it continues talking about the Holy Spirit uh, and how it gives us a victorious life. How many knows that we're victorious because of the Spirit, right? Uh, the Holy Spirit helps us. So Romans 8.31 says this, If God be for us, who can be against us? What then shall we say to these things? To what things? The suffering, the problems, the issues. What shall we say to them? If God is for us, who can be against us? Right? Uh, so it's the Holy Spirit that causes us to be triumphant. That's part of the reason why... Uh, Jesus said to his disciples, you go and tarry and wait for the Holy Spirit, for the infilling of the Holy Spirit, because you're going to need it in order to be uh, triumphant as a Christian in this life. So, uh, <clears throat> if you go all the way back to the beginning of Romans, you might have wondered whether or not God was really for us. <laughs> the first couple of chapters, remember what we talked about? Everybody sinned. Nobody is worthy. Uh, uh, everybody had an opportunity to know the Lord, uh, even just through his creation. All those things, and it's kind of like stacking everything up against, we, you know, we're, we're, we're sinners, we're, we need repentance, we need all that. Uh, but now Paul, through, uh, throughout the book of Romans up to this point, has now begun to describe, but... Even though we were in that state, now we're not. You were a sinner, you're not now a sinner. I don't like the phrase that people say, uh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, you were a sinner saved by grace. Because you are now a child of God. I know there's semantics to that, but uh, I think sometimes we need to understand that we're not who we used to be. We're not the old man, we're... The new man in Christ, right? Uh, so, <clears throat> so now Paul has shown us that we have been saved from the wrath of God. We have been uh, equipped for victory over sin and death. And uh, we don't have to doubt that God is for us. If I was preaching, I'd say, look at your neighbor and tell him God's for you. Right? That's <laughs> 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 And if he is for us, who can be against us? What does it matter if others are against you? Now, I don't like people to be against me. Do you? I don't like that. I like every, I want, I'm a people pleaser. I want everybody to like Brian, but I've never been able to achieve that. Not everybody's going to like you. That's the truth. But if God's for you, what does it matter? Now, I'm not telling you to go out and make everybody mad either. <laughs> but if God's for you, then you you and God can be a majority, right? Uh, and, and you can be victorious. One person plus God uh, can make an uncom uncomfortable majority. Uh, so, we can know that we're saved through the Spirit testifying to us. We can know that God is for us through the same Spirit, right? Because there's a difference in being saved and God necessarily being for you. Because you could think, well, God saved me, but He really just, you know, He just saved me and He don't really like me. He don't really love me. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but God is for you. Um, now, can I tell you that this is not saying that God is for everyone. I was hoping I'd get some shocked looks. 
Does God want everybody to be saved? Yes. yes. Is everybody saved? No. no. Or is everybody a child of God? No. no. This is a promise to children of God that God is for us. Right? Now, that doesn't mean that God's against the sinner. He wants them to be saved. But this is a promise to those who have Christ as a Savior that God is for us. Uh, because just because you think God is for you, he may not be. Now, I'm not talking about Christians. I'm talking about how many of those that there are people out there who are deceived and they think they're doing the right thing. And they think they're, uh, and their God may be different than our God, right? Uh, so you can be involved in doing the wrong thing and God's not for that, right? Uh, but he's for us. What's the link? What makes us victorious? What makes God be for us is that we are linked with Christ, right? And we have the power of the Holy Spirit helping us. So, um, so what is the evidence that God is for us? Read verse 32. Verse 32 tells us, and I love this, this is one of my favorite verses. Are we okay? One of my favorite verses in all of Romans says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So what's this saying? God gave his very best when he gave Christ. He didn't hold back anything. He gave us the very best. So if God... God is a complete giver. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to describe what I'm saying. And that sounds wonderful, right? I give you a car. Just give it to you. But you can't have the key. How much would it help you, right? If you don't have the key, you can't drive the car, right? So the evidence that God is for us is that he gave us the very best, which included everything. Through Christ, the Bible tells us we have everything we have need of. Everything. Now, it might not always feel like it. We may feel like we have other needs. But if we're connected with Christ and He's our Savior, we've got all we need. He is the, uh, <clears throat> he's the gift that meets every need for us. So, He didn't spare His Son. Uh, Jesus is the ultimate gift. This time of year we talk about gifts. I mean, like to give, you like to give your loved ones things that are special and for them, uniquely picked out uh, because you know them. Well, God knew what mankind had in need, and Jesus was the perfect gift to meet the needs of mankind for our salvation, for our healing, for our justification, for all these terms that we've been using. Uh, in the book of Romans, Jesus is the answer. Uh, he is the ultimate gift. Uh, and how could he give us that? How could he just give us Jesus and not give to us all the things that Jesus paid for? Right? Uh, so, <clears throat> that's kind of what uh, Paul is saying, saying here. If you have your Bibles, we're reading now verse 33 through 39. And I promised you this is going to be short, so I'm... I'm making it short. Um, and it says this. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God. Who also makes intercession for us. Did you know that Jesus prays for you? Makes intercession for you. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are counted all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors. Imagine that. That's what the Lord has done for us. We're more than conquerors.
believers through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And this, that concludes this chapter as far as the last few verses. So, uh, how many knows the devil likes to make you feel guilty? Right? What's this? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? The Bible, especially in the book of Revelation, speaks about God being the ultimate judge. He's the judge of all the earth. So if the judge of all the earth, does it really even matter when others, he may bring other people or the enemy, the devil, comes against us with the charge? Because he, what does he do? What does the Bible say, say the devil does? He is the accuser of the brethren. Right? And I can, day and night, day and night, right? Uh, I can imagine God Almighty just with his hand up, like, talk to the hands. <laughs> I've already, I've already declared that they're not guilty, right? Uh, so, uh, who can, who shall bring a charge against us? Uh, nobody can. If we have God on our side because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, no, it doesn't matter who tries to condemn us. Uh, and Jesus acts as our advocate. You ever heard that in the Bible? What's an advocate do? Anybody work in the court system? Or child, uh, the federal uh, children's programs? They have advocates, and what do they do? They speak for you. They speak for you. They work on the behalf. Uh, of, of those that they are serving. And so that's what Jesus does. He's an advocate, a go-between between the Father and us, right? See, when God looks at us, the Bible is declared in, in Romans, it says that our righteousness, I think it's Romans, is like filthy rags, right? So we don't approach God looking like filthy rags, though, because he would spit us out. What does he see? He sees the blood, right? Because the Bible tells us we can boldly approach the throne because of the blood of Christ. So Jesus is our advocate uh, in anything that comes against us. He promotes us. He does things for our benefit, and he does not condemn us. And there's therefore, this chapter starts, there's therefore no condemnation for those who are in uh, Christ Jesus. We're more than conquerors. Doesn't that sound amazing? <clears throat> I mean, how, you, how are you more than a conqueror? You're at a greater level, right? Uh, then a, a conqueror is a pretty awesome thing. But you're more than a conqueror. So no matter what our circumstances. Paul, you know, the, the one thing that I love about the Bible is it, it doesn't candy coat. Paul in this chapter is saying, hey, you're going to have some suffering. You're going to have some problems, some issues. You're going to have the enemy come against you and try to accuse you and do all these things. But in all of this, in all of your suffering, you are more than a conqueror. And there's nothing that can separate you. Why are you more than a conqueror? Because God loves you through all of this, right? Uh, and nothing can separate you from the love of God. It makes us more than conquerors. Uh, in this, it talks about all the things that you could go through. It talks about uh, that you can go through death, or you can go through persecution, or famine, or nakedness. And just to kind of clarify, the, the word naked here is not like what we today would term as naked. Because we, we look at naked as with no clothes. Somebody doesn't have any clothes on at all. And that's not what this term means. Uh, because in today's terms, that would be indecent, right? But what that means is simply a lack of clothing because you didn't have any way to buy them or get them. 
not that you're standing there naked and shameful, right? Uh, so that nakedness <coughs> is just a, a lack of having the ability to buy food, buy clothing, and to cover yourself. So uh, the sword that it talks about there is an implication of execution. At the time that Paul wrote this, uh, he was in Rome, he was in prison, and he knew that he could be facing ultimately death. He'd already, man, look at Paul's resume. I mean, he's stoned, he's beaten, he's shipwrecked twice, he's all these things that he's gone through. He hasn't yet gone through the sword, which is execution. Uh, he hasn't personally experienced that, but he knows that he's even going to be more than a conqueror through that. You know when you're most the conqueror, the more conqueror than anything? At the end of your life, whenever you pass away and you don't die. What do you mean you don't die? You don't die. Jesus said you don't die when it's all over. He said that you don't you don't die. Even though you die, you don't die. Why? Because it's just like turning the page, right? You go from this life into a life that includes heaven and being in the presence of God for to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. And so at that point, man, you overcome it all. You're victorious. You're more than a conqueror. <coughs> uh, and so that's kind of where Paul is is going there. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up really, really fast. Nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, nothing that appears bad or evil, or even nothing that appears good, can separate us from the love of God. Right? Nothing. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. We can make a choice. To walk away from God, but nothing other than our own self could ever separate us at all. And then, can I just tell you that I think it's harder to separate from God than what we imagine? I don't think it can be that. I'm, I'm not a person that believes in eternal security <laughs> full out, but I'm, all, I'm a person that does believe that God is extremely merciful and that God. Um, well, he's more merciful than what we can imagine. And so, anyway, this here says nothing can separate us from the love of God. Uh, some of the, really some of the highlights are in this last section, that it's the Holy Spirit. That's a continuing thing that helps us be triumphant and victorious and overcomers. And that's true in our life today. It's the Holy Spirit that does that. It's the keys given to drive the car. Yeah, it's the keys. Uh, evidence uh, that God is for us is that he gave us his best. That's, that's another key thing uh, in this last section. And then the last uh, thing that I think is, is really important is that we have been declared not guilty. One of the tricks of the enemy is to make you feel unworthy, guilty, um, like you're not really saved. It's it's a real work of the, of the devil to do that. I mean, I've had people come to me and and uh, and I said, uh, so I heard you got saved. I'm so glad to hear about that, but, but I don't feel saved. Well, then you have to. Explain that it's not about feeling, it's about walking by faith, right? You're not going to feel that way all the time. Uh, well, you may not, especially early in your walk. Because the devil tries to use that trick on you when you're <coughs> a baby in Christ, especially. I'm not saying he doesn't use it on other people, but I'm saying that's especially when, when people first get saved, they are. Um, vulnerable.
to more vulnerable to that kind of attack for the devil to say, you didn't really get saved. Yeah, that was just, you know, you just said words. It didn't really change anything. It didn't make a difference. He's uh, the maddest. He just lost them. Well, absolutely. Yeah, he's going to say everything and anything he can to pull them back. Because 